Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Miss Elisa, and this is my YouTube channel where we talk about science and math. This class is physics. It's primarily designed for homeschoolers, but if you like the way I explain things, come on in and feel free to learn. We're going to be talking about, it's, this chapter is called The States of Matter, but we're also going to be talking about things like intermolecular forces, pressure, buoyancy, um, flight, cool things like that. So come on in and let's talk about it. I'd like you to like, share, and subscribe. I have a goal, and it's to get a thousand subscribers to make it easier on me. I'm, I'm just admitting it so that I can do YouTube live instead of having to record it and then upload it. It takes a lot longer, and so I'm doing this to be free classes for homeschoolers. So it would so share it with your homeschool friends. And there's eight classes for math, for science, and you can have those for your high school classes. I uh, use older public school textbooks. We're using this one for physics. Um, the physics hasn't changed and the books are cheaper. I know homeschoolers, a lot of times we have to pinch our pennies, don't we? So anyway, um, I'm Miss Lisa and we're gonna talk about the states of matter. Now, what are the states of matter? You learned this a long time ago in middle school, didn't you? Solid, liquid, gas, and plasma are the four states of matter. The main ones here on Earth are solid, liquid, and gas. Plasma is found in stars and fluorescent lights in a few places like that, but it's more rare. We're not, we, we don't deal with it so much. Um, so let's talk about um, something I've told you before is in physics, we consider fluid both gas and liquid. And the reason why is because you can use them a lot for the same things. You can put them in hydraulics. You can put oil in a hydraulic piston to make your car go up and down like uh, I always think of cars where the cars are making the truck go to sleep. The cars go all around him and they can go up and down. Those are hydraulic pistons and those could have gas in them or they could have oil in them. Things that, that um, I, a long time ago I used to have a Honda Civic. Loved that car and one day I was sitting waiting to turn onto my road and my husband and I lived really close to the city of Atlanta back then. Really close. You can see the skyline right there. And um, I was sitting there waiting to turn into our, our little road to take us to our house. And some car, and this was before people were on their cell phones all the time, somehow totally overlooked my little red car, hit it in the back. I went flying through the air, and, I, and I'm pushing the brake as hard as I can as I'm flying through the, through the air. Um, and of course, it, the brake does not work when you're airborne like like the Dukes of Hazard. Uh, so I'm flying through the air, and um, the the car gets all smashed up. But it was a real new car, so they fixed it. And it didn't even occur to me to check that when you would open the hatch, it'd just come right back down and bang you on the head because it's one of those hydraulic pistons. And in the wreck, it had gotten smashed, and the body shop. Did, Either they didn't check or they forgot to, to change it. And it just took me forever to get back and get that thing fixed. I got banged in the head so many times I opened up the hatch back of that little car. But those are pistons. And so a lot of times in physics, it could be gas or liquid that is used in the same way. Another way is with convection. You, we talked about that last time. You could have a fan blowing, causing the gas or liquid to blow, to move in currents, either one, and it can transfer heat. So a lot of times it doesn't matter. And, and also, like in a refrigerator, we talked about in the coils, that what's in those coils switch back and forth from gas to liquid, depending on where they are in those coils in the back of your refrigerator. So um, that's why they're both considered fluids. Now, are they different? Yes, and we will talk about why in this chapter. All right, so in your book, I'm looking at page 266, and just like the other chapters, there will be a part two that has the math. So states of matter, the math, come back for it. Okay, so the first thing we have to talk about is you are living in a sea of air. <laughs> you don't notice it because you've always lived in the sea of air and you are used to the pressure. But right now there is tremendous air pressure on you. Hold out your hand. Look at one square inch on your palm, just one little square inch. The atmosphere pushing down the sea of air that you're in, pushing on that one little square inch 
is 14 pounds of pressure, 14.7, almost 15 pounds of pressure on that one little square inch. Now look at your stomach. One square foot is 2,000 pounds of pressure, 2,117 pounds of pressure on your stomach. You don't even feel it because you've lived your whole life in the sea of air under all this great pressure. But if I took your body, this is your body at the end of my hand, and I took it and I threw it out into space without a spacesuit, what do you think would happen? You would be pushing back and the pressure wouldn't be pressing on you and you would pop like a piece of popcorn. Eyeballs coming out, guts coming out your mouth. Disgusting. So I guess there's a life lesson there. Don't go to space without a space suit. And also, if you've ever watched the Jimmy Neutron movie where they're flying along without a space suit, drives me crazy because they would all pop like popcorn. Now, let's talk about it as we apply it to fish. So you got fish and they're under even more pressure at the bottom of the ocean. Um, when these deep, deep, deep sea fish are pulled up to our pressure, it's like them being thrown into outer space and you can go on the internet and see it. But these fish, their eyeballs will come out, their guts come out, their mouth and anus, and it's disgusting. And it's because they've lived their whole life under great, great pressure and now they're under much less pressure without a, an earth suit. We need a space suit. They would need an earth suit. And they end up, it ends up not being good for them. They have to keep these fish from deep, deep ocean under pressure so that they are all right they're, because they're used to that pressure. So that's the first thing. So there's a, so the amount of pressure on us at sea level, it's less if you go up to the mountains, but the amount at sea level is called one atmosphere because that's how much pressure is on one earth is one atmosphere of pressure. I already told you it's worth 14.7 pounds per square inch or 2,117 pounds per square foot. Another unit that we measure this in are called Pascals or Newton per square meter and it's 101.013 times 10 to the fifth, one, two, three, four, five, um, pascals, but usually you end up doing it in kilopascals, which sounds like someone's doing something terrible to pa somebody named Pascal. But um, so I usually think of that one as 101.3 kilopascals. It's 33.92 feet of water. So that means if you had a straw and you suck up, you are not really sucking the water up into your mouth. The atmosphere is pushing down on the surface of the water. You make a vacuum in the straw and it pushes the water up into your mouth. So that means there's a limit on how long a straw would work and it's 33.92 feet. After that, this, the atmosphere is not pushing enough for you to make a vacuum. You cannot suck water up just using your mouth. It's not strong enough. And you can tell this if you've ever had a bottle with a straw going into something that's a sealed flask and you try to suck it, you cannot. We used to a long time do this thing where we would use it like an Erlenmeyer flask and put you know, liquid in it and put a straw in it and the kids would try to suck up. We don't do that anymore. We got all these, you know, got to be careful about COVID and germs and all that. So things are a little different now. But if you ever try it, you cannot suck unless the atmosphere can get to it and it push it up. Um, it's also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And that's what they use in, in barometers, a lot of old weather equipment. They would use mercury for that. And, um, and that's or tour. It's the same thing. Um, we don't use mercury so much it, it, like in the high school lab anymore because mercury is poisonous. It's, you can get a Mad Hatter's disease. You can, it's poisonous to touch it. It can be absorbed through your skin. So don't play with mercury and it's poisonous to breathe in the vapors too. So when I was in high school, we used to have mercury thermometers where we would measure um, things in the lab because they're really good. But if they break, then you've got mercury in the lab and it's dangerous. So now they've just got the red stuff in them. They used to have silver stuff in them. Now they get that was mercury. Now they've got red stuff in them, which is alcohol. And the, the colored alcohol wears out after a while. And it, um, it, it ends up getting little gaps in it. It's not as good. But, you know, got to be safe.
uh, high school science is not worth anything being dangerous. And then the other one is um, a lot, sometimes in things you'll see that that's the same thing as 29.92 inches of mercury. So in America, where we use inches and in the, the uh, English or imperial units, um, it is, uh, we'll use, we, they would use inches of mercury in like weather equipment, like barometers and stuff. All right, so we're gonna do some problem with that. So one of the units is Pascal, um, and we talked about those units. Oh, the, the, um, the formula for pressure is force over area. So you can have a big force, and that makes pressure, or you can have a small area, and that makes pressure. And there's a, a little picture in your book on page 267, and it tells you that if you, if you had your foot stepped on, either by a big old elephant foot or a little bitty stiletto high heel. The one that actually has more pressure and will break bones in your foot faster is the high heel. That because it's such a small area, if a lady puts her weight on that um, versus an elephant putting his or her weight, her weight, we'll see it's a girl elephant, on their big old foot, it is less pressure per square inch, centimeter, whatever, and it actually does more damage. It's worse to be stepped on by a high heel than an elephant. Isn't that weird? But there's a nice little picture of a lady in high heels and an elephant at the circus. I don't think circuses are gonna be around much longer if they even are. We, we went to the circus. We had a homeschool field trip to the circus and we had front row seats for really cheap and it was interesting, but not my favorite thing. I'd rather go to the zoo than the circus, I think. But. If you like them, don't let me discourage you. All right, so fluids at rest, hydrostatics. Okay, um, there was a guy uh, named um, Pascal, who we named the pressure unit after, and he was the first person to figure out that pressure applied to a confined fluid, that could be a gas or a liquid, at any point is transmitted undiminished throughout the fluid. So you, you, when you have pressure, it goes out in all directions and it doesn't really lose pressure. It goes out in all directions. And that was Pascal who figured it out. We're gonna do some problems with that. Okay, next. Um, the idea is buoyant force. You might have heard buoyancy or a buoy. Some of those are called buoys. But then it has to do with floating. And what it is, is there is a force that is the floating force. And it's what pushes you up if you float, or if there's not enough of it, you sink. So here I've got this little power brick, and imagine that I'm dropping it into water, okay? It is pushing out of the way a brick, exact brick amount of water. Does that make sense? It goes in where it is, there used to be water, that water has been pushed out of the way. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the water displaced. So if the brick weighs more than the water it displaced, it sinks. If it weighs the same as the water it displaced, it floats in the middle. If, you know, just neutrally buoyant, just right there. If it is weighs less than the water it displaces, it floats. And that's how buoyancy works. So say you've got a hydrogen balloon, you've got, or oh, helium balloon, we don't wanna blow them up. Uh, just a helium, a nice inert helium balloon. Will it float? If what it's pushing out of the way is air. If the helium weighs more than the air, it will sink. If it weighs the same as the air, it'll be neutrally buoyant and just sort of float in the middle. If it weighs less than the air it displaces, which it does, then it floats. Okay, and there's another little thing to think about. Well, we're gonna do that later. It's the lab we're gonna do later. I'm not gonna tell you about it now. I don't wanna spoil the secret, the, the, the fun of discovery. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say about that right now. Um, okay, so Archimedes, Archimedes principle. Density equals mass divided by volume. Let's see if I can write this where it could show up. Density equals mass divided by volume. And I think that was one of the first things we learned in here. Maybe it was physical science. And we maybe did a little lab with that with significant figures. Um, so density equals mass over volume. Okay, so this is what the story is. It was that a long time ago, Greece wasn't a country, it was city-states. So each city was a kingdom with a king and you know, his army and things like that. 
Well, there was an old scientist back thousands of years ago named Archimedes, and he was the official scientist of the king. The king had bought a crown. He had given the crown, not crayon, but crown, to the crown maker, and he had given him a certain amount of gold to make his new crown out of. But the king did not trust the crown maker. He thought that the crown maker had made it, had kept the gold, made it out of lead, and just painted it gold. But, or put a little bit of gold on it. Where it looked gold, felt heavy, but wasn't really gold. So, but he didn't suspicious, well, he wasn't suspicious enough to cut the crown and to look inside and mess it up. So he asked his scientist, Archimedes, is there some way to find out if it's gold or not without destroying it? So Archimedes is like, I'll think on that. So he goes home and he's getting in the bathtub. And when he gets into the bathtub, the water goes up. And he understands that he could find out if the crown was gold or not by finding out the volume by water displacement. They could put the crown in the water. How much the crown goes up, that's its volume. They could weigh it to get the, the weight or the mass, divide it, and if, and if it's gold, it always gives the same number. The density of pure gold is something like 19. I'm sure it's in your book and lead is less, and they can get this number and they can tell. So, you know, there's a little truth to some stereotypes, and the one about that scientists can be kind of spacey seems to be a little bit true, because Archimedes, one of these early scientists, according to the legend, oh, hold on, sorry about that. I have three phones in here. I record with two of them, and then I have another one. Um, according to Archimedes, uh, according to the legend, he jumped out of the bathtub naked and goes running through the town yelling Eureka, which means in Greek, I have found it. That he bust into the royal hall, bust into the king's present, buck naked, yelling Eureka, I found it, because he had figured out how to figure do this. And it might be true, but Either way, maybe he was spacey and forgot to, to get his toga before he went running his toga, Greek. I don't know. Some of y'all are, I'm sure, ready to correct me on that. But um, and it turns out, according to legend, that it was not gold. And I think the crown maker was killed because he tried to rip off the king. So anyway, so this is called Archimedes' Principle, that you can tell the different, you can find the density by water displacement, and then you can um, find out the density, and the density is a physical property of the substance. And every substance has its own density, just like things have their own um, specific heat that we learned about before. So there used to be this old TV show, it's called Beekman's World. Beekman! It's probably on YouTube somewhere. But in it, I love where he teaches this concept of, um, of buoyancy. He had a phone booth, I don't know if y'all know what they were, but look it up. It's what Superman would go into to change. It was a, he had a phone booth that was all sealed shut and full of water. And he went into the top and he got in. And it pushed out one Beekman's worth of water out of the phone booth. It, it displaced one Beekman's worth of, of water out of the phone booth. So you can really get that visual idea of pushing one of the things out of the way, displacing one thing out of the way with um, buoyancy. So, and then Lester was the lab rat. It was a guy in a suit of the lab rat. And I always remember him with the, butt, the mop going, uh, displacement, displacement. All I know is I gotta move this water from this place to that, to that place. Cause he's displaced to that place. So displacement, he had to move it from this place to that place. So. Anyway, I loved Beekman's World. When I taught physics in public school before, um, I would make my kids watch it. It's so old now, I probably couldn't get away with it. And they'd be like, Miss Blackburn, this is lame. It's funny though, I like it. Okay, Archimedes Principle. We're gonna do some math with that. Fluids in motion, hydrodynamics. Okay, so there's a weird idea with, with um, fluids in motion. And weirdly, they make a low pressure. We think they make a high pressure, but it's really low. And you've seen this before probably, but not realized it. 
Where you've seen it is the shower. You get in the shower and if you have a shower curtain, you turn up that water and you have a fluid moving fast, the water coming out of the shower. And that shower curtain, does it blow it out or suck it in towards you? It sucks it in towards you. You're trying to get that yucky shower curtain off of you. It's all wet and cold and not good water at all. Maybe dirty even. Okay, so that is one of the things of, of you see a low pressure where fluids move fast. The other one is it's why airplanes fly. You always wondered, wondered how a big old steel airplane can fly in air and not fall. It's this thing. It's called Bernoulli's Principle. Invented by Daniel Principal, no, Daniel Bernoulli. And, uh, uh, and this is how it works. If you have an airplane wing, it's flat on the bottom and curved on top. The air goes by it. The air on bottom has a shorter route to go, the air molecules, than the air on top. They have to go further. That spreads them out more. And when they're spread out, it causes a low pressure on top a high pressure on bottom, and it picks the plane up. Isn't that interesting? So you can read more about that. They explain a little different. They don't use the, the airfoil like I do, but you can read about it in your book. Okay, now what's the difference in liquids and gases? I keep telling you that you they're both fluids, but remember I said they are different. Look in your book on page 274 and you will see the difference. The first one is, a liquid has a definite volume. A gas takes the volume of its container. You know, it'll, it'll fill the whole thing up. Um, number two, a liquid is practically incompressible. You, you can't compress a liquid. And I do this thing where I have a sealed Dasani water bottle that I push around and pass around and let all the kids squeeze it and see if they can compress it, and they can't. And then I have a Dasani bottle, water bottle full of air, and I push do that around, and all the kids can squeeze it, and they can feel how much that gas is compressible. Okay, the third one is the particles of a liquid are very close together. The volume of the particles makes almost all the volume of the liquid. A particle of a gas takes up very little space and the container is mostly empty space. So in a liquid, the particles are close. In a gas, they're very far apart. Um, the other thing is because liquids are so close, there's forces of attraction between the liquid molecules and there's not between the gas. The gas are not attracted to each other, um, or it's such a tiny, tiny bit, it doesn't count, And but the liquid has particles that make them stick together. So the next thing we talk about is surface tension, and where does that come from? And it has to do with cohesion and adhesion, and we're gonna talk about capillary forces. Um, uh, Okay, where do these forces come from? So here I have my water molecule. I usually have a smiley face right there, but I made it water. And how we know it's water is water looks like unimpressed Mickey Mouse. The reason why is because this is made of oxygen and two hydrogens. There's something in chemistry called electronegativity, and it's how well an uh, atom holds electrons to itself. And when you have an oxygen sharing electrons with hydrogen, they do not share the electrons equally. The oxygen's a big old bully and keeps the electrons mostly. And the hydrogens hardly ever get that electron. So that makes it where the hydrogens end up with a partial positive charge and the oxygen ends up with a partial negative charge. And so this one Mickey Mouse is not all by itself in the universe. If there is another water molecule, then the negative part of that water molecule will line up with the positive part of this one. Or there'll be another one over here with the negative part near this positive part. Or there'll be one down here where the positive part is with that negative part. It makes water molecules stick together. What, that's why water um, balls up into raindrops and raindrops aren't flat. And it's what causes surface tension. The water sticks together so hard it makes a force on the surface, sort of like the skin, that is so strong where these forces don't want to break, they don't want something to go in between them, that it makes a, a, a force where they're held together so tight that bugs can walk on top. We do a lab, if we were face to face, I would have us do it where I get a Petri dish 
from like a biology dish and I put water in it and I give everybody a needle and if they drop it real careful, real flat, you can make the needle float on the surface tension, just like how bugs can walk on the surface of the water. They're walking on that force, holding them together. It's one of the things that cause us to have life on this planet. If water didn't have this surface tension, then some things would happen um, because of this, this polarity is what it's called, because it, just like how our Earth has the North Pole and the South Pole, the water molecule has a positive end and a negative end. It's called a polar molecule. And because of that, it causes all these things that cause life on our planet. One is it causes water to have that high specific heat we talked about before, which makes our, where our planet is a nice temperature for life. It doesn't get too hot during the day. It doesn't get too cold at night because of these forces between the water molecules. Another thing it causes is normal um, things when they freeze, they would freeze from the bottom up. But because water has its shape and, and the way the molecules line up, it makes it line up with little air pockets. So when like the oceans or ponds freeze, they freeze at the top. It makes a layer of insulation because there's air trapped in it. It floats and then the fish can live underneath and all the ocean of lake life can live through the winter underneath their nice little insulation layer. Um, another thing it does is because of this, it actually causes lakes and oceans to be stirred. Um, it causes it where trees, these molecules are so sticky that they can go up trees, though trees can get water from the ground, up through the, the um, xylem in the tree. Remember you learned about xylem and phloem in biology. It pulls the water up these little tubes called xylem and it's able to actually crawl up the walls because it's so sticky and there's forces of attraction between the tube and the water molecules between positive and negative is because opposites attract and it makes it where trees can drink. Trees can drink, they make oxygen, we breathe it, they make food, we eat it. Um, all these things are all because of the perfection of that water molecule being polar and um, that's why water and carbon are these two huge chemical things for us being able to have life. All right, so your book is gonna talk about that, adhesion, them um, cohesion, they stick to each other. Adhesion, they stick to something else like the, the xylem. And capillary action is how it can go up without a pump. It can just crawl up a skinny tube if it's skinny enough. Um, evaporation and condensation. When things evaporate, they go from a liquid to a gas. If they do it easily because it's not polar, then it is said to be volatile. So things that are volatile are like rubbing alcohol. You put rubbing alcohol in your hand, it feels cold because it is evaporating. Evaporation takes heat energy away. It's a cooling process. The opposite of evaporation is condensation. If you have like a water molecule moving along and it hits a, a nice cold Coca-Cola bottle, then it will slow down give its heat energy to the Coca-Cola bottle because it's cold and it'll warm that Coca-Cola bottle up a little bit and eventually you get condensation drops on the outside. So condensation is a warming process, evaporation is a cooling process. And you've known that if you've ever walked into a steamy bathroom after someone just took a bath, it's like, oh, it's warm in here. It's because it's a warming process. Okay, the last state of matter is plasma, and it is found in stars and fluorescent lights, and you can read more about it. Now, what about solids? We've talked about this before. Solids are in something called a crystal lattice. They're in a pattern where, like if it's salt, it's sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride, and underneath this sodium, it's chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride. A nice pattern of sodiums and chlorides, one after another. Each one is a positive next to a negative, being stuck together by opposites attract. So they make these things called crystal lattices. They, the atoms stay in their little pattern. Now, as it's heated up to become a liquid, they break out of that crystal lattice and then they can say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and they can go by each other and then they're a liquid. But as long as they're in that pattern of that very strong crystal lattice where the molecules can't move around, they can only vibrate, 
that it's a solid. Now, there is some weird solids. There are, your book calls it an amorphous solid. Sometimes I've heard them called non-Newtonian fluids. But there are certain things that are solids, but they can still say, excuse me, excuse me, and move around the other molecules very slowly. Um, a lot of these respond to force. One is silly putty. You ever got silly putty? If you pull it gently, it spreads out. If you pull it fast, it snaps. So if you pull it gently, it acts like a liquid and lets you pull it. But if you pull it fast, it'll snap like it's a solid. Another one is if you mix cornstarch and water and make a thick paste. Um, if you hit it hard, it gets hard and it can it'll respond to your force but if you push it soft your your hand will go down into it and goop there are lots of um, labs that you can do with these and lots of stuff with this online probably on pinterest would have a lot of these that teachers have put up fun things to do with their either called non-newtonian fluids or amorphous solids okay so solids are elastic they can bounce off of each other some more than others um they have elasticity and that's measured as one of their properties. Um, another thing that solids do is most solids, when they're heated, expand. Um, and when they're cooled, they're, they contract. I used to have this thing at, that was just in my desk when I taught public school the first time. And it was a, a metal ring on a stick, kind of like that, and a ball on a stick, kind of like that. And I was like, what do you do with these? And if you put them together, the ball would not go through the ring. Finally, I saw them in the science catalog. I was like, oh, that's what it's for. It was for this. If you took the ring and heated it up, then the ball could go through. So it showed that it was a whole little thing to demonstrate this. I, was, I, I had that for years and didn't know what it was for. I'm like, I'm not throwing it away. I'm sure it's for something. And then there it was in the science catalog. So I'd always get it out, heat up in my Bunsen burner, the ring, and go, ta-da! Uh, solids, they can expand while they're heated. And different solids expand at a different rate. So that's how thermocouplers work. You take two, two different metals, fuse them together. And then when they, they have a temperature change, it'll bend because one is expanding or contracting at a different rate. And that's how old thermostats work, the ones where you turn the dial and a lot of things like that. Places where you couldn't put like a thermometer because it'd break, um, you can put a thermal thermocoupler where it can tell the temperature without a thermometer using this expansion property of metal. That's what that is. All right, let's see if there's anything else we need to talk about. And there is a coefficient of linear expansion and a math problem that we're going to do in the next video. All right, that's it. Chapter 13. I think this one's kind of easy compared to some of the ones we've been doing. I think physics kind of gets easier after you get to a certain point, And I think we might have hit the easier part, or at least one of the easier parts. So come back for part two, and we'll do the math. Science is great. Math is great. Physics is great. Like, share, subscribe. I'm Miss Lisa. See you soon.